John Brown's Autobiographical Letter to Henry Stearns, written July 15th, 1857. My dear young friend, I have not forgotten my promise to write you, but my constant care and anxiety have obliged me to put it off a long time. I do not flatter myself that I can write anything which will very much interest you, but I have concluded to send you a short story of a certain boy of my acquaintance, and for convenience and shortness of name, I will call him John. This story will be mainly a narration of follies and errors, which it is to be hoped you may avoid. But there is one thing counted with it, which will be calculated to encourage any young person to persevering effort, and that is the degree and success in accomplishing his objects, which to a great degree marked the course of this boy throughout my entire acquaintance with him, notwithstanding his moderate capacity, and still more moderate acquirements. John was born May 9th, 1800, at Torrington Litchfield Co., Connecticut, of poor but respectable parents, a dissident on the side of his father of one of the company of the Mayflower, who landed at Plymouth, 1620. His mother was descended from a man who came at an early period to New England from Amsterdam in Holland. Both his father and his mother's father served in the War of the Revolution. His father's father died in a barn in New York while in the service in 1776. I cannot tell you of anything in the first four years of John's life worth mentioning, save that at the early age he was tempted by three large brass pins belonging to a girl who lived in the family and stole them. In this he was detected by his mother, and after having a full day to think of the wrong, received from her a thorough whipping. When he was five years old, his father moved to Ohio, then a wilderness filled with wild beasts and Indians. During the long journey, which was performed in part or mostly with an ox team, he was called on by turns to assist a boy five years old who had been adopted by his father and mother and learned to think he could accomplish smart things in driving the cows and riding the horses. Sometimes he met with rattlesnakes, which were very large and which some of the company generally managed to kill. After getting in Ohio in 1805, he was from some time rather afraid of the Indians and of their rifles, but this soon wore off, and he used to hang out about them quite as much as was consistent with good manners, and learned a trifle of their talk. His father learned to dress deerskins, and at six years old, John was installed a young buckskin. He was perhaps rather observing as he ever after remembered the entire process of deerskin dressing, so that he could at any time dress his own leather, such as squirrel, raccoon, cat, wolf, or dogskins, and also learned to make whiplashes, which brought him some change at times, and was of considerable service in many ways. At six years old, John began to be quite a rambler in the wild new country, finding birds and squirrels, and sometimes a wild turkey's nest. But about this period, he was placed in the school of adversity, which, my young friend, was a most necessary part of his early training. You may laugh when you come to read about it, but these were sore trials to John, whose early treasures were very few and small. These were the beginnings of a severe but much-needed course of discipline, which he afterwards was to pass through, and which it is to be hoped he has learned him before this time that the Heavenly Father sees it best to take all the little things out of his hands which he has ever placed in them. When John was in his sixth year, a poor Indian boy gave him a yellow marble, the first he had ever seen. This he thought a great deal of, and kept it a good while, but at last he lost it beyond recovery. It took years to heal this wound, and I think he cried at times about it. About five months after this, he caught a young squirrel, tearing off his tail and doing it, and getting severely bitten at the same time himself. He, however, held on to the little bobtail squirrel, and finally got him perfectly tamed, so that he almost idolized his pet. This too he lost, by its wandering away or by getting killed, 
and for a year or two, John was in mourning, and looking at all the squirrels he could see to try and discover Bobtail, if possible. I must not neglect to tell you of a very bad and foolish habit to which John was somewhat addicted. I mean telling lies, generally to screen himself from blame or from punishment, and he could not well endure to be reproached. And I now think, had he been oftener encouraged to be entirely frank, by making frankness a kind of atonement for some of his faults, he would not have been so often guilty in afterlife of this fault, nor have been obliged to struggle so long with so mean a habit. John was never quarrelsome, but was excessively fond of the hardest and roughest kind of plays, and could never get enough of them. Indeed, when for a short time he was sometimes sent to school, the opportunity it afforded to wrestle and snowball and run and jump and knock off old seedy wool hats, offered to him almost the only compensation for the confinement and restraints of school. I need not tell you that with such a feeling, and but little chance of going to school at all, he did not become much of a scholar. He would always choose to stay home and work hard rather than be sent to school, and during the warm season might generally be seen barefooted and bareheaded, with buckskin breeches suspended often with one leather strap over his shoulder, but sometimes with two to be sent off through the wilderness alone to very considerable distances was particularly his delight, and in this he was often indulged so that by the time he was twelve years old he was sent off more than a hundred miles with companies of cattle, and he would have thought his character much injured had he been obliged to be helped in any such job. This was a boyish kind of feeling, but characteristic, however, at eight years old, John was left a motherless boy, which loss was complete and permanent, for notwithstanding his father again married to a sensible, intelligent, and on many accounts a very estimable woman. Yet he never adopted her in feeling, but continued to pine after his own mother for years. This operated very unfavorably upon him, as he was both naturally fond of females, and withal extremely diffident, and deprived him of a suitable connection link between the different sexes, the want of which might under some circumstances have proved his ruin. When the war broke out with England, his father soon commenced furnishing the troops with beef cattle, the collecting and driving of which afforded him some opportunity for the chase on foot of wild steers and other cattle through the woods. During this war he had some chance to form his own boyish judgment of men and measures, and to become somewhat familiarly acquainted with some who have figured before the country since that time. The effect of what he saw during the war was to so far disgust him with military affairs that he would neither train nor drill, but paid fines and got along like a Quaker until his age finally cleared him of military duty. During the war with England, a circumstance occurred that in the end made him a most determined abolitionist, and led him to declare, or swear, eternal war with slavery. He was staying for a short time with a very gentlemanly landlord, since a United States Marshal who held a slave boy near his own age, very active, intelligent, and good feeling, and to whom John was under considerable obligation for numerous little acts of kindness. The master made a great pet of John, brought him to table with his first company, and friends called their attention to every little smart thing he said or did, and to the fact of his being more than a hundred miles from his home with a company of cattle alone, while the negro boy, who was fully if not more than his equal, was badly clothed, poorly fed, and lodged in cold weather, and beaten before his eyes with iron shovels or any other thing that came first to hand. This brought John to reflect on the wretched, hopeless condition of fatherless and motherless slave children, for such children have neither fathers nor mothers to protect and provide for them. He sometimes would raise the question, Is God their father? At the age of ten years, an old friend induced him to read a little history, and offered him the free use of a good library. 
by which he acquired some taste for reading, which formed the principal part of his early education, and diverted him in a great measure from bad company. He by this means grew to be very fond of the company and conversation of old and intelligent persons. He never attempted to dance in his life, nor did he ever learn to know one pack of cards from another. He learned nothing of grammar, nor did he get at school so much knowledge of common arithmetic as the four grand rules. This will give you some general idea of the first fifteen years of his life, during which time he became very strong and large of his age, and ambitious to perform the full labor of a man at almost any kind of hard work. By reading the lives of great, wise, and good men, their sayings and writings, he grew to dislike of vain and frivolous conversations and persons, and was often greatly obliged by the kind manner in which older and more intelligent persons treated him at their houses, and in conversation, which was a great relief on account of his extreme bashfulness. He very early in life became ambitious to excel in doing everything he undertook to perform. This kind of feeling I would recommend to all young persons, both male and female, as it will certainly tend to secure admission to the company of more intelligent and better portion of every community. By all means, endeavor to excel in some laudable pursuit. I had liked to have forgotten to tell you of one of John's misfortunes, which set rather hard on him while a young boy. He had, by some means, perhaps by gift of his father, become the owner of a little ewe lamb, which did finally till it was about two-thirds grown, and then sickened and died. This brought another protracted mourning season, not that he felt the pecuniary loss so heavily, for that was never his disposition, but so strong and earnest were his attachments. John had been taught from earliest childhood to fear God and keep his commandments, and though quite skeptical, he had always by turns felt much serious doubt as to his future well-being, and about this time became to some extent a convert to Christianity, and ever after a firm believer in the divine authenticity of the Bible. With this book he became very familiar and possessed a most unusual memory of its entire contents. Now, some of the things I have been telling of were just such as I would recommend to you, and adopt them as part of your own plan of life, and I wish you to have some definite plan. Many seem to have none, and others never stick to any that they do form. This was not the case with John. He followed up with tenacity whatever he set about so long as it answered his general purpose, and hence he rarely failed in some good degree to effect the things he undertook. This was so much the case that he habitually expected to succeed in his undertakings, which this feeling should be coupled with the consciousness that our plans are right in themselves. During the period I have named, John had acquired a kind of ownership to certain animals of some little value, but as he had come to understand that the title of miners might be a little imperfect, he had recourse to various means in order to secure a more independent and perfect right of property. One of these means was to exchange with his father for something of far less value, Another was by trading with other persons for something his father had never owned. Older persons have sometimes found difficulty with titles. From fifteen to twenty years old, he spent most of his time working at the Tanners and Couriers trade-keeping Bachelors Hall, and he officiated as cook, and for most of the time as foreman of the establishment under his father. During this period he found much trouble with some of the bad habits I have mentioned, and with some I have not told you of, his conscience urging him forward with great power in this matter, but his close attention to business and success in its management together with the way he got along with a company of men and boys made him quite a favorite with the serious and more intelligent portion of older persons. This was so much the case, and secured for him so many little notices from those he esteemed that his vanity was very much fed by it, and he came forward to manhood quite full of self-conceit and self-confident, notwithstanding his extreme bashfulness. 
A younger brother used sometimes to remind him of this and to repeat to him this expression, which you may somewhere find, a king against whom there is no rising up. The habit so early formed of being obeyed rendered him in afterlife too much disposed to speak in an imperious and dictating way. From fifteen years and upward, he felt a good deal anxious to learn, but could only read and study a little, both for want of time and on account of inflammation of the eyes. He, however, managed by the help of books to make himself tolerable, well acquainted with common arithmetic and surveying, which he practiced more or less after he was twenty years old. At a little past twenty years, led by his own inclination, and prompted also by his father, he married a remarkable, plain but industrious, economical girl, of excellent character, earnest piety, and good practical common sense, about one year younger than himself. This woman, by her mild, frank, and more than all else, by her very consistent conduct, acquired, and ever while she lived, maintained a most powerful and good influence over him. Her plain but kind admonitions generally had the right effect, without arousing his haughty, obstinate temper. John began early in life to discover a great liking to find cattle, horses, sheep, and swine, and as soon as circumstances would enable him, he began to be a practical shepherd, it being a calling for which in early life he had a kind of enthusiastic longing, together with the idea that as a business it bid fair to afford him the means of carrying out his greatest of principal object. I have now given you a kind of general idea of the early life of this boy, and I believe it would be worth the trouble, or afford much interest to any good-feeling person. I might be tempted to tell you something of his course in afterlife or manhood. I do not say that I will do it. You will discover that in using up my half-sheets to save paper, I have written two pages so that one does not follow the other as it should. I have no time to write it over, but for avoidable hindrance in traveling, I can hardly say when I should have written what I have. With an honest desire for your best good, I subscribe myself. Your friend, J. Brown P.S. I had liked to have forgotten to acknowledge your contribution in aid of the cause in which I serve. God Almighty bless you, my son, J.B.